Hello, uh, my name is Agelos Katsagelos. I'm a professor at Northwestern University in Chicago in the Department of Electrical and Computer Engineering. Well, uh, we're not short of challenges, but uh, by and large, I would say in the field of uh, computational imaging, it's primarily the <clears throat> trade-off between uh, hardware and software, it's one way to look at it, or the optics and the algorithms. And finding the, the fine balance is, is always a, a, a struggle. But by and large, uh, there is uh, quite a bit of uh, push nowadays um, through the direction of learning. Uh, we have uh, a lot of data available to us and based on which we can train <coughs> a learning system such as a deep network, deep uh, neural network, to perform tasks hopefully more efficiently or more accurately than before. However, it's not a absolutely straight path with no obstacles. For example, um, in this workshop was the fact that we need to marry to find a happy marriage between analytical and analytical or modeling and learning techniques and by doing so judiciously we can improve what uh, we already have. Yeah, they're really interested. It's uh, one of the hot, I might say, areas. And of course, uh, learning and deep learning in particular is also one of the very popular uh, topics. Now, um, having been in this field for a very long time, what uh, you see is that um, there are, you know, pluses and minuses, pros and cons. It's very easy, quote unquote, for somebody to learn the basics in deep learning and with the proliferation of uh, great tools like TensorFlow or PyTorch and Keras and so on, um, a, you know, a very smart person in a matter of a month or less could start generating results. Um, however, this does not mean that this person has a very deep understanding, no pun intended, of you know, the underlying physics and the underlying problem. And as a result, you see a lot of um, results, you know, at conferences, workshops that um, are, again, are produced without a very deep understanding because deep learning itself is a little bit of a black box, as we call it. We don't fully understand what's under the hood of the car. And um, because of that, also, it's hard to verify results. It's hard to tell, uh, you know, why one algorithm is doing better than, than another one. So there are, you know, challenges right there. But of, on the other hand, we have seen a number of advances that uh, became um, possible uh, because of the power of, uh, you know, GPUs and computational resources and the abundance of data. Certainly, um, we, you know, the big umbrella is uh, computational imaging um, and machine learning, you would say, the two main pillars. And then um, in machine learning, we do some uh, theoretical work uh, of how to, again, understand what the network is doing. We use some visualization, so-called approaches, uh, such as activation, maximization, uh, but also some other theoretical work that allows us to learn some of the um, coefficients of the shallow layers without doing um, backpropagation, but looking at, at the characteristics of the data. And then um, we apply deep learning to different directions. For example, we have a project that we work with um, data from LIGO. This is the interferometer that discovered uh, the gravitational waves. <clears throat> and we're not really after gravitational waves, but we're after the glitches, which are the abnormalities, if you wish, in the data, 
which are important because they tell us about the health uh, of, the, of the instrument, of the interferometer. And there actually uh, the project has an interesting twist because it captures the interaction between humans and machine. We use citizen science with the Adler Planetarium in uh, Chicago and um, initially the machine helps the citizens, the crowds to be trained and after they're trained they're feeding back to, to, to the project, to the machine. Um, so uh, uh, <clears throat> another direction we're doing quite a bit of uh, analytical, you might say, work is on, um, on crowdsourcing. If you have um, a lot of annotators, how do you combine the different annotations? Because some annotators are careless or laser, lazy or malevolent uh, and uh, or spammers and therefore you have to judiciously do that. But it has many, many implications because uh, in many cases data, even if we have the data, we don't have reliable labels. So um, medical field, we do quite a lot of work with medical images and it's quite expensive for a senior uh, doctor to label the data. So if we have a few labeled data and a lot of uh, labels provided by the crowds and we are able to train a classifier, let's say, to have the performance as if the senior person had labeled all the data, <clears throat> then we can provide a great service to in that direction. So, um, these are some examples. Um, and as I mentioned, we are, um, I'm, I'm, I'm starting a center at Northwestern um, AI in medical imaging. So there's quite a bit of emphasis in, in medical applications as well, yeah. Yeah, images, as you said, are everywhere uh, for scientific applications, for entertainment applications. Uh, I mean, there are no movies that are made today that are not digitally touched. So wherever we used to use, again, I call them analytical techniques or modeling techniques to process visual data, um, we see slowly but steadily such approaches being replaced by, by learning algorithms, by, by, by deep networks, right? Convolutional neural networks, for example. 